All right, thank you. I would, uh, I'm going to talk about, if I can figure out how to do this, talk about amputations for a minute. Um, <clears throat> you know, I don't really want to talk about amputations. <laughs> it's, it's, they're sort of boring. Have any of y'all been written up in the patient safety uh, network thing for being disruptive? <laughs> you don't have to show your hands. If you haven't, you're not doing a good job. That's my personal opinion. I'm going to make a plea that we need to have disruptive surgeons. There was a thing on Medscape the other day talking about disruptive surgeons. And, it, you know, it was written by a hospital administrator. How in the heck do these people know a damn thing about what you're facing when you're trying to push a patient through the system and you're the patient's advocate? I just tell you, I think we need more people to stand up and get on their hind legs and get the right thing done for patients. And surgeons, and vascular surgeons in particular, this is a difficult disease. You know, cardiology, I don't know, it's a little bit different. You're, you're a little bit distracted from your patients in some ways because the complications often fall to somebody else. One of the reasons vascular surgeons are such a bunch of neurotic people is because they do amputations. And if you take a claudicant and you do a bypass, and you cut their leg off six months later, it has an indelible impact on your judgment for the rest of your life. It's, a, there's, it's an amazing uh, event. Now you take limb salvage, you got some renal failure, diabetic patient, and you wind up with an amputation. It's not a bad outcome. It's kind of part of the process. It's almost an expected outcome. You take a claudicant that you know damn good and well, if you don't touch them, they got a chance of losing their leg that's practically not measurable in their lifetime and you do some kind of procedure, an SFA intervention, angioplasty, or something else, and you wind up with an amputation, you never forget it. And I, I guarantee you, he's got names in his memory of people that he wished he had never touched, and they're now walking around on one leg. I can remember a woman from England, the first woman that's ever happened to me. And I thought, man, this is, this is dangerous stuff. And it only takes one of those people to make you become very conservative when it, turn, when it comes to intervention in the lower extremity. But amputations, I think, is kind of the, the basis of our conscience as vascular surgeons. Anyway, there's a fair number of amputees in the United States. Oddly enough, I, I was actually surprised to see that most of those were due to vascular disease. I would have guessed just kind of off the cuff that trauma was probably a more common cause of amputation. But actually, of the total number of amputations, a big fraction are due to, uh, due to uh, vascular disease. Obviously, diabetics are just unbelievably disadvantaged when it comes to the risk for an amputation. Uh, amputees that are diabetics, this is a classic kind of board question. They're more likely to be severely disabled. They're more likely to experience their initial amputation at a younger age. They're more likely to progress to a higher level of amputation, and they're more likely to die at a younger age compared with patients without diabetes. So question, so should this patient have an amputation? Well, first of all, it's hard to tell if it's an it is actually a patient. I mean, it's just it could be a pair of feet that are not connected to anything. But <laughs> assuming that there's a patient connected to this uh, pair of feet, should you do an amputation? Who's, is it cardiology in here too, or just vascular? This is just vascular. Just vascular. Okay, so we can talk freely. All right. Uh, so, so would you do an amputation? Yes. I don't think you can answer this. You're looking at a picture of a pair of feet. You don't know what's attached to it, whether there's a ventilator on the other end of this thing, three kinds of, you know, uh, impellas running and all kind of <laughs> ventricular assist device. You have no idea. That may be a perfectly great outcome for this person, right? So why would you cut somebody's foot off? There's really three reasons. Well, four if you include, include punitive. And you will do this. I guarantee you some of you will cut somebody's leg off because you're just tired of messing with them. <laughs> that right? Absolutely. You've done that, right? Absolutely. <laughs> it's like, Preferentially. I'm not going to splash somebody's arm band uh, yeah, like, unless I love those people. And I don't yes, love most of these exactly. People. Emotion matters. <laughs> While you were out, by the way, I gave a plea for the disruptive surgeon that we need more of them. Well, thank you. I wasn't talking about you. No, but that's the reason I came back. I know there's, there's, <laughs> defend there's, yourself. There's no human being on the planet that knows more about amputations than John Hyde. So. Yeah, I've done plenty, <laughs> that's for sure. I've had a lot of failed vascular interventions. And I'm, I'm just, it's part of life, I'll tell you. So I think the reason you cut somebody's leg off 
Uh, painless ischemic necrosis, so-called dry gangrene, is not an absolute indication for an amputation. You get an awful lot of these things referred in, though, from the nursing home because the family came in on Sunday in their every six-month visit, and grandma's, grandma's foot was hanging out on the bottom of the bed, and half of it's dead. And then, you know, they send them over, and, and the, she's sick as stink. She's in the emergency room, and you're stuck with, well, should I cut this leg off? And anesthesia's like, we're not going to put this woman to sleep. She's barely alive now. And you say, well, but, but uh, blah, blah, blah. So why should you, what, should you cut that foot off? A lot of times there's no reason to. If the problem is it just looks bad, you know, Curlix and uh, some Silvadine is a great cure for just cover it up, hide it. <laughs> That's exactly right. I'm not crazy, I'm telling you. Okay, the reason you cut a foot off is if you have unmanageable pain, not yours, patients. So the patient, you can't manage. doesn't mean they don't have pain, but they can't. And you know what they say in a nursing home, what the indication of, of pain is in nursing home patients that are not able to tell you I have pain? Grinding their teeth. This is, you see this in medical legal stuff all the time. They didn't take care of the wound. They provided bad nutrition. They didn't roll the patient. They didn't do uh, proper wound care and they didn't manage the pain. How do you know they had pain? Well, she gnashed her teeth. There was teeth grinding was a sign of pain. It's, it's very common in the, uh, you know, when you get an amputation and the nursing home gets sued for it. You see these advertisements on TV all the time. Did, did your loved one lose a leg in the nursing home? <laughs> all right. Second would be the limb is a source of an adverse systemic effect, meaning the limb is harming them. And the two ways the limbs usually harm you are either sepsis located in the limb or there's, bad enough, there's enough dead tissue that you're winding up with bad kidneys, so some kind of pigment nephropathy. The third would be sometimes you wind up in this kind of rehabilitation abyss where you're just stuck with a commitment to healing this wound and you're not able to go on with the rest of your life. So you're sitting in a wheelchair for six months, you might as well have been sent to the moon. The impact of that deconditioning is very important. You know, you go to the moon for a week, you can't stand up, your bones demineralize, your muscle goes away, all of this stuff. We pay, put people at bed rest for weeks at a time, and then we tell them non-weight bearing so they can heal this thing. It has a huge impact on their global health. Their cardiovascular fitness is go, goes to hell. And what do we do? We just keep sitting there and we see them back in wound care and they, you know, we change the dressings. It's a huge impact on a person's life. Sometimes it's better to cut the limb off and allow them to rehabilitate, get some nutrition, get some exercise, start to you know, develop a, a, you know, some energy, some ability to walk. To, you know, and it's not a simple thing. So this impediment to rehabilitation, though, I think is a kind of an important concept. There is a cost to deconditioning over time where you may get far enough along that road, you're not ever salvageable. You don't really ever come back, even though we, quote, save your limb. And then there is this last uh, issue, which is sort of cosmesis or hygiene. Sometimes these things really just smell bad, and the families want them amputated because when they come in on Sunday, it really smells bad. But you know, a little Clorox, uh, a, a light, well, what do they call it? What's the uh, Dakins? A little Dakins and a. And a and there's a, that, uh, there's a, that Kevin Spacey movie, you know, the yeah. Seven Deadly Sins, and you know, you can hang enough of those things that hang in your car. In a yes, room and, right. it'll go away, yeah. exactly, the little uh, Christmas trees. All right, amputation principles. The level of the amputation is dictated by the extent of the disease, healing potential of the stump, rehabilitation potential of the patient. And obviously, you've got to take off all the dead tissue. Uh, gold standard for prediction of amputation level. You know, you go, if you open up Rutherford, there's just all kind of stuff on how to amputate and, you know, how do you predict amputation level. I just find it incredibly uninteresting. I, I really just... And no, it doesn't, nobody pays any attention to it. The reality is you kind of look at the leg and you make a decision based on clinical experience. And if you've got a Doppler signal at the level above the amputation, you've got a very high chance. And what is very high? Is it 82%, 93%, or 98%? It doesn't make a bit of difference. You've got a pretty high chance that it's going to heal if you've got a Doppler signal above the level of amputation. And that's about all you want to know is it's most likely going to heal and if this person has some rehabilitation potential, you're going to take that gamble. If they have no rehabilitation potential, meaning the ability to walk with this uh, limb, then you're not going to gamble on a 10% failure rate. You're going to move to a higher level, which would be usually an AKA. Toe pressure, pretty useful if you're looking at likelihood of four-foot amputation healing. 
This, you know, the slide set's made by somebody else, by the way. You know, when we do these things, they send these out to us, so we don't really read any of these cartoons, but uh, I'll let you read it. Uh, the other issues with amputations are uh, infection. Everybody, you know, the, the risk for DVT is probably highest in amputees in terms of vascular patients of any other group, other maybe be aneurysms. And we probably do a terrible job as a group of really worrying about nutritional status when it comes to improving the likelihood of amputation healing. A bunch of different levels. I want to show you. These are the bones of the foot. Uh, I find that I can never remember uh, almost any of these except for the toes. I can remember there's two bones in the big toe and three in the others, which never makes any sense to me. And I have to look at my hand to remember there's two bones in the big toe and three in the other toes. And that cuneiform cuboid thing, uh, it's just a mystery to me. So every time I do a midfoot amputation, I have to go back and look at this. The, the one thing that I do sort of sometimes remember, not consistently, is they call it Lisfranc's joint, is the joint between the metatarsals and the tarsals. So that first, if you took out metatarsals completely, you'd have a Lisfranc amputation. If you took out the stuff proximal to that, that's a Chopard amputation. And the problem with those is you lose all the sort of tendinous structure around the ankle. And even though they do heal, um, you mind if you don't have a really good prosthetic guy who's going to come in and create a boot that's really strong around the ankle, they do tend to break down over time unless you do some kind of intra uh, ankle fusion, which most of us don't do effectively. Uh, in a toe amp, racket, racket so-called incision is, is pretty effective. It seems intuitive, and all you guys do toe amps and don't really think about it, but you know, screwed up toe amputation really messes up somebody's life. Now they got a, a wound vac and a long period of time uh, with a not very uh, appealing wound, and the racket is a good way to do it. This uh, is sort of funny, actually. It's from Up to Date, uh, and it's the illustration in Up to Date from a chapter that I did on amputations, and I looked at it the other day, and I said, man, I hate that. That's a terrible illustration because it does sort of exactly the wrong thing in that uh, this is way too far cut back. <clears throat> and a lot of people do this on their big toe. First time you all do a big toe amputation, I guarantee you're going to go to the base of the toe and kind of cut a circle, and then you're going to try to pull the skin together, and it won't cover the metatarsal head. And the next thing you know to do a ray amputation. A first ray amputation is a bad, is a bad problem because your whole foot mechanics lifts off the first metatarsal head. If you take it away, you have a lot more over time, the foot tends to collapse. If you take the first two metatarsal heads, you might as well do a transmet. And I will almost always do a transmet even for a first ray, especially if they have any other uh, bony abnormality. But the first two rays, your foot's just messed up. And it may heal and get you off the rotation, but six months later, they'll be back with ulceration at the third metatarsal head and then the fourth metatarsal head. It's good for your bank account, but it's not particularly good, I think, for the durability of their foot. Uh, so I tend to, the point of that is to try to make sure you don't cut too far back and have to get a first raise. So try to make that incision kind of a little bit more of a flap that gives you a chance to cover the metatarsal head without losing it. Uh, the so-called ray means you're taking all or part of the metatarsal. Transmet, I think it's probably not a bad idea to have this little gentle curve to the, I, I hate a transmet that looks like, anybody know Tom Dempsey, remember Tom Dempsey? Anybody that's old enough to remember Tom Dempsey? What is he famous for? 63 yard field goal, okay, so, and he had a transmet that made, he had it done intentionally so he could be a kicker. No, it's not true. It was a, it was a transmet. Anyway, Liz Frank, Chopard, Symes. Symes is not worth a darn. The problem with the Symes is that it's hard to make a prosthesis. Symes means you basically cut the ankle off, you know, the middle of the ankle. Trouble is now you've got a big bulky prosthesis and your feet look weird in public. A BKA, your ankles look identical and it mechanically works just as well. You still can't stand up at night and pee with a Symes. You still get out of bed and fall over. So there's no big advantage to a Symes and that's why hardly any of us do them unless it's a you know, pretty unusual circumstance to justify a Symes. Almost all patients are better off with a BKA than some, uh, you still lost, again, full length leg. Uh, it's, it's sort of something to do, but I don't think it's really very useful. BKAs, there's a lot of different ways you cut the flaps. The only thing you remember is that the shape of the flap really has nothing to do with the healing, and it really depends on what the viability of the tissue is. 
a lot of these people have pain in the after post-op period. And just remember, not all post-op pain is um, uh, phantom limb pain. There are other reasons, mainly ischemia. That's the main thing I want to say. Thank you.